glad and honored that I'm invited here to speak and that our lab, our team, is part of uh, GVN. I'm, I'm really happy about that and really want to contribute as much as we can. Um, so um, the, the lab has two uh, directions. We have a direction uh, towards developing, and that's a long-standing work, towards developing small molecule uh, antiviral drugs. And another direction is the development of um, highly thermostable uh, vaccines. I don't have the time to talk about that, but during coffee we can discuss it if you want. This is uh, the title of my talk, Antiviral Therapy. A lot has been achieved, but yet far to go. We still have to do a lot. Um, and by the way, this is a town hall of the city of Leuven. It's a beautiful town hall. It's 550 years old. And as you can see, Annecy is almost as nice as Leuven is. Um, so uh, what do we have today? Well, we have, uh, as you know, drugs to treat herpes viruses. Uh, hepatitis B can be kept under control. Um, HIV, we have 30 drugs to treat HIV in combination. Uh, in, in most cases, HIV can be controlled and quite spectacular. Uh, hepatitis C can now be cured in, in with combinations of highly specific, highly potent uh, drugs, mostly without side effects, in uh, five to eight uh, weeks, sometimes 12 weeks. But so a chronic viral infection can be cured by just a simple combination of uh, pills that you can take orally. So that's quite remarkable. Uh, there are some flu compounds. I believe we need better uh, uh, flu compounds in addition. And this is what we do not have. We do not have um, drugs to treat infections with uh, many other viruses, including uh, pyramixos, to which also belongs RSV, enteros, uh, polio, rhino, arena, bunya, corona, name it. And of course, you will see that it will be impossible to develop uh, drugs against each single virus, not against Japanese spilitis and, and uh, each single corona, each single uh, flavy. So what we may need are drugs that have sort of pan genus or pan uh, family uh, virus uh, activity. And I will touch upon some of these uh, viruses. This is a screenshot of the website uh, of our lab, and you see that we uh, work on, on multiple of these uh, viruses. I would like to quickly touch in this 20 minutes on uh, some of them. How do we uh, find uh, or come up with, with antivirals? Well, one aspect is that you can work target based. You can take an enzyme and try to find. Uh, inhibitors of the enzyme, for example, the, the protease of, of um, enteral and rhinoviruses. But what we also find a lot of fun is to uh, basically use the cell as a black box, the infected cell as a black box, and go in, screen compounds, and, and find compounds that hit that block replication, and then go fishing, go searching what the mechanism of action is of, of such compounds. And then you learn novel things about uh, viral replication and also identify novel targets. And of course, you need to screen large compound libraries, and we now <coughs> typically do 300,000, 400,000 compounds in, in screens. Um, and I compare it sometimes with looking for the needle in, in, in the haystack. Uh, the haystack is the cell, the black box of the, uh, of the infected cell, where a lot of hocus pocus is happening inside. And then you're trying to find the needle. And of course, the more needles you have, the more compounds in your screen, the more chance you have to pick up at least one that is uh, of some interest. Now, to um, facilitate uh, identifica identification of, of compounds, you need, of course, uh, high throughput screens. And if you work with uh, highly pathogenic organisms, it's good to do that in sort of a safe uh, containment. And so what we built uh, recently is a, what we call a lab in a box, also named uh, CAPSID. Um, and so the blue box that you see is an airtight box. The uh, air pressure inside is minus 200 Pascal. Uh, and all the on top is all the uh, air handling, and in grey, let's see where the pointer is. Oops, I have not the pointer. Ah. So all this is the air handling, and in grey here are four incubators with revolving platforms, and there's a robotic system inside that basically brings the the plates to the uh, to the incubators. And this is a connection chamber to a walk-in with a three plus lab. Uh, with a glove box system. Um, so Peter Leysen in our lab is the person who designed that, worked on that for years, and it's, it's now ready. Some people, I'm looking at, at Bob and Ab and, and others have, have seen it. This is uh, the, uh, the building um, of, the of the equipment, and this is a look inside. So here you do have the uh, robot arm that goes uh, all over the place. It's a box of about three and four uh, meters. 
in the golden you do have these access points to the incubators. You have plate washers, you have plate readers, you have two high contrast images, and each of these equipment has, has their own uh, small robotic arm so that they can handle plates uh, while the uh, over uh, arching robot is basically running around. So the system can basically work uh, 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And uh, there's, as of course, I mean, no risk for contamination of, of, of technicians, of, of scientists working with the, um, with the pathogens. You can see we do have a little movie on the, uh, on the website. You can uh, check that movie. And if I have a couple of minutes left after my slides, maybe I show that. So this is the uh, glove box system. Uh, so uh, basically, we, we put everything in a, on a very small uh, footprint. Of course, I mean, this is also, we uh, would also love to open this uh, to members, well, not really open it, but I mean, give access, provide access um, to, to members of the, of the GVN uh, so that people that need, for example, um, extensive high content imaging experiments uh, prepare the, 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 the experiment and then uh, we could set it up into the system and we col collect samples in the middle of the night and do readout in the middle of the night whatever you want. This is all the air handling on top of it. And now let's talk about serious things, dengue. Um, I don't have to introduce dengue, but you know that in, uh, during epidemic situations, uh, this can really overwhelm the healthcare system. Uh, hospitals, here they see in, in Lahore, they see a lot of patients, put three patients in one and the same bed. The um, uh, Sanofi Pasteur did a fantastic work towards developing the, uh, the vaccine, but there's some problems as well associated with it. And we thought that it would be good uh, to have also antivirals against uh, dengue and, and Flavius. Um, and as, as Flavius belong to the same family as hepatitis C, if it's possible to cure hepatitis C, why would it not be possible to come up with some potent inhibitors of, for example, dengue? So we screened our compound library, came up with hits, picked the best hits, and then with the medicinal chemist, optimized uh, these hits. And initially the hits had some better activity against dengue 2 than against the other serotypes. We also improved that. And now we have a pan serotype compound with no low, low nanomolar to picomolar activity. And also, of course, we uh, run, and this is done with uh, Xavier Lamballeri and his team, uh, the testing against clinical isolates, which, which is, of course, of utmost importance. And the question is, how does it work? So we select for resistance. And if you have the resistant virus, uh, identify where the mutations are, put the mutations back into the infectious wild type clone and then hopefully confirm that these uh, particular mutations confer the uh, resistance. Now, interesting, interestingly here, so this is the plaques or these are the plaques of wild type uh, dengue and it took us about 15 passages of about a week with dengue before we had the first resistance, or let's say shift in IC50 coming up and then we see that we have, it's difficult to see, also a small plaque phenotype in between the big plaques and after 20 weeks we almost have only, and 25, 30 weeks, only small plaques. And these plaques are viruses with reduced fitness, which is interesting, of course. But as you can see, it took a long time to get resistance. And that's interesting. Um, and then when we sequenced these variants, we found that the mutations are all in NS4B. And NS4B uh, is an essential uh, uh, part of the replication uh, machinery of, of, of flavor viruses. NS4, well, also hepatitis C has an NS4B, but it's there is no uh, homology, um, and we find mutations uh, here in that region, and if we put them back in, the uh, virus is, of course, again resistant. But the um, interesting thing is that if you get the first mutation, first comes the first mutation with just a tiny little bit of resistance, then comes the second mutation, then the third, then the fourth, and you need all four of them to have uh, full resistance. Next question, of course, is it active in uh, animals? And this is the AG129 uh, mouse uh, model that is in infected with dengue type 2. You see the control mice that are sick and uh, a, a mouse that is protected uh, by uh, using, uh, by, by treating with the compound. So we have a lot of data to show in all kinds of, inf well, all kinds of, of schedules with the, with the compound doses uh, that the compounds, and we have roughly 2,000 analogs in the series now, are highly, highly potent. Um, this is work uh, mostly done by uh, Xavier Lamballeri in, in Marseille, and you can see that we have a panel of all uh, serotypes uh, of, of dengue with uh, different isolates, clinical isolates, and it's a busy table. You don't have to, to check out the values, but it just shows that for most of the, uh, of the isolates, we do have 
uh, low nanomolecular, even picomolecular potency of, of the compound. So a really a f highly effective class of compounds. And of course, as an academic lab, you cannot further develop that. So we're really happy that after the funding that we got from the Wellcome Trust to develop this class of compounds, that Janssen Pharmaceutica took the license uh, on this class of compounds. And this is in full swing development and currently is in phase one uh, clinical studies. So we're quite hopeful that this is a class uh, with some uh, potential. But of course, it's not only um, uh, dengue, uh, other flavor viruses around West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, tick-borne encephalitis, Zika, uh, yellow fever, <laughs> which is of course a fantastic vaccine for yellow fever, but still many people die because the vaccine doesn't get to all these remote places in the tropics. And there comes our second story that I will not tell you, that we have a new vaccine uh, strategy developed by Kai Dahlmeier, who is here in the audience and who will be very happy to explain you more if you wish. Uh, that is highly uh, currently stable and then can pr be produced in, in not only a chicken eggs, but in fermenters. Then chikungunya. I don't have to introduce chikungunya to you, but look at this lady, an otherwise healthy lady that is really suffering uh, from this uh, joint pain. Um, so also there we screened our library and here we found uh, a class of compounds, a compound, heat compounds from a collaborator in, in, uh, in Spain. And this is just one of the examples within the class. And you see that we do have activity against lab isolates and against clinical isolates, and also some against finished wheel and equine encephalitis. This, well, this is just a tool compound in the series that we use now. It's not too potent, but we just use it as a tool. And you see we have about micromolar activity. And then comes again the question, how does it work? So again, selecting from resistant variants. And in this case, we found a mutation in NS1, or NSP1, put it back into the uh, uh, infectious clone and could show that this was conferring resistance. So what is NSP1 doing? Well, it's, it's uh, and this is a beautiful review article by Etienne de Curly, it takes care of the capping of the uh, chikungunya alpha virus RNA, transfer of the guanylil, and methylation of the cap. Um, now, we, um, Bruno Canard in Marseille has, and Bruno Cotard, they have an assay, this capping assay, and it could, they could show that the compound is beautifully blocking the capping, the transfer of the cap to the, uh, to the RNA. And if the mutation is introduced, you see that capping doesn't happen anymore. So there's very little effect on methylation, but a beautiful effect on capping. So the cool thing is that we have basically, by doing a phenotypic screen, coming up with a compound, identified for the first time, we believe, a compound that blocks the capping of alpha uh, viruses. So identification of yet a new target after the, uh, well, the NSVB of, of, of flavors. You need reference compounds also, and uh, everybody knows, of course, T705, Favipiravir, the flu compound, which does have activity against some other RNA viruses. And here we use Favipiravir, and this is the, the work of Lynn Belang, who is also here in the audience, so the mice are being inoculated in the food part, and then they develop um, viremia, and also the virus goes to the other uh, joints, for example, here in, in the hands. And you can see that if we use favipiravir, that we do not have, uh, that we don't detect uh, chikungunya in the, uh, in the joints of the hands and the wrist. Uh, so we believe that this is more sort of a tool compound, a reference compound in this assays, but it shows that you can block uh, chikungunya an ongoing chikungunya replication even in the joints. Then enteroviruses and, and rhinoviruses. Rhinoviruses, common cold is just unpleasant. It's nothing bad, but in people with COPD and asthma, it can cause severe exacerbations. And then you have all these antiviral infections, um, hand, foot, and mouth disease, and, and uh, conjunctivitis. Um, uh, but also you have EV71, uh, which causes, in particular in Asia, it can cause uh, severe encephalitis has been the problem, or is the problem with EV68 in the US, uh, and, and polio and the polio endgame, uh, antivirus may be important as well. Now for rhinoviruses, some people believe that we may need something else than, than uh, antivirals, but we know better, of course. Um, and um, this is uh, for the polio endgame, we can discuss that later if you wish, but and as also explained yesterday, two highly potent antivirals with a different mechanism of action are needed uh, to, uh, to help in the, uh, in the end game against polio. Now, compounds that have been around for a long time are the capsid uh, binders, such as uh, Pleconaril and uh, Vapendavir. And basically what these compounds do here, you see a antivirus particle with a five-fold axis here, um, and there's a canyon here under VP1. And if you make a section, you see that you have this canyon, and the uh, 
receptor is basically engaging with, with the capsid. Now, if you put the, the compound there, the compound is basically blocking the capsid, and engagement with receptor is not happen happening, or encoding is, is also not happening. So these compounds block that uh, canyon, but they also rapidly select for resistance. And for kappa vir is uh, in, uh, has recently been in, in uh, challenge models in humans, so OPV challenge models, uh, and there is some activity, but there's also resistance coming. So we're looking also again with these phenotypic screens for other compounds, and so this is pleconaril, this is another compound that we identified, small molecules, inhibitors, and we selected for resistance, and found mutations in the capsid. We found that the compound blocks attachment to the cell, um, and made some other observations. And uh, then with uh, Sarah Butcher in, in Helsinki, by cryo uh, we we w once we knew also where the mutations were, and we knew, knew that the mutations were not in this pocket where uh, the capsid bind is bind, um, we could confirm that uh, by cryo -EM. So here you do have uh, VP1, VP1, VP2, VP3, with pleconaril sitting in this uh, pocket. And here you have again VP1 in blue, VP2, VP3, with here our compound sitting in a different uh, place, basically a place that is an intera inter interaction site between VP1 and VP2. Um, and this is when we look at other anterior and rhinoviruses and over do the overlay, this is basically a conserved pocket. And that's interesting because the capsid pocket uh, that I just talked about is present in anteriors and rhino A and rhino B, but not in rhino C. And we find that the pocket that we have here, and you do see the compound in orange, is basically conserved among all anterior and rhinoviruses. Of course, you still need to further optimize the compound, but that's quite an interesting uh, part to pursue. Yet another interesting, um, but perhaps not a mole molecule that can be developed as a drug, are dendrinase of, of tryptophan. We found that this very efficiently blocked the attachment of antiviruses to the, to the cell. And this is the dose response curve for uh, lab isolates, and this is for 21 clinical isolates. And we see incredible potent activity against clinical isolates in the lower picomolar range. Again, selecting for resistance uh, and introducing the mutations back. And we found mutations that confirm resistance just around the five-fold axis. And uh, then with uh, Susan Huffenstein, uh, cryo -EM was done. And here you see the five-fold axis and three-fold axis, two-fold axis. Well, the compound is really blocking uh, the five-fold uh, vertex, and you see the compound sitting there. Time is running on us, yeah. <laughs> um, so quickly, this is yet another class of rhinovirus inhibitors that we uh, discovered together with uh, the team of chemists in uh, the, at the Crick Institute in Dijon, highly potent against antiviruses and rhinoviruses after some optimization, and also against polio, and some of the compounds have been tested at CDC and are highly potent against polio. Again, uh, where do they act? Well, we found by mutation analysis that they act in 2C, and 2C is a helicase, putative uh, helicase. We need four mutations, high barrier to resistance. And with the team of Bruno Canari, with homology modeling, we have some idea how they could work. But they are fantastically active in animal models. For example, in a pancreatitis model in, in, in mice, we do have eight log reduction infectious virus. We can cure skid mice uh, that uh, die rapidly after coxsackie infection uh, completely by uh, using uh, the compound. So it's non-nucleoside analog. How many minutes do I have? Uh, minutes. <coughs> two minutes? Yeah. yeah, two minutes. Okay. I'm, I'm almost gone. So quickly about uh, viral diarrhea, which is of course not an emerging or re-emerging, but still uh, a lot of people suffer from it. Um, I went to the website of WHO, 4 billion cases a year, three days on average, four events a day, 200 milliliter, that's so much and people always forget how much that is, and therefore I made this calculation, so that's <laughs> so much. Uh, so what we did is basically uh, we tried with the reference compound, a nucleoside analog that was the first compound to go in uh, clinical trials for hepatitis C uh, of phalicocytobin, and we could show in, in mice that you protect the mice against uh, lethal challenge with this virus. The fecal consistency is okay, and the control animals, we do have necrosis, and you keep the gut intact if you give the compound. <coughs> and uh, if we infect mice, put them together with sentinels, we transfer the this, uh, transmission of the virus to the sentinels. If we treat the sentinels, we can completely prevent them from infection. And this basically may be important in hospital settings and hospital wards and long-term care facilities where this uh, viruses, norovirus, is rapidly uh, spread, and you should be able to block them. 
I don't have much time to talk on that, but what we have seen, observed, found, is that we can infect lice of zebrafishes. This is work of uh, Joanna Pereira in the lab. We can infect three-day-old lice of zebrafishes with uh, norovirus samples from uh, schools, and then we have highly efficient replication for a couple of days of human uh, noroviruses, and we can even let the fish swim into uh, water that has uh, an antiviral compound, and as you can see, we then block replication. Two words about rabies. Uh, it's a shame, I mean, still 60,000 people are dying from rabies each year once the virus is in the brain. It's a death sentence, all people die. And if we can cure hepatitis C, if we can, in five to eight weeks, cure a chronic infection in the liver, why would we not be able to help survive people that have the first symptoms of, of, of rabies? The first symptoms are, for example, typically hydrophobia, and uh, you know that at that time they can still walk and talk and write, uh, but they will die in five to six days. So what we're doing is we're working on a trying to identify uh, rabies inhibitors that you could simply give by an IV line that goes to the brain and would hopefully uh, help people with the initial signs of rabies, 60,000 people a year, mainly kids, uh, to survive. And I will skip hepatitis E, but just to say uh, that we found that so positive the hepatitis C drug does have some activity on uh, hepatitis E uh, replication. Perhaps this compound, in combination with ribavirin, could uh, be used to control hepatitis E in, in um, transplant patients with chronic hepatitis E. And the, l well, the conclusion is that you will agree with me, we still need antivirals against uh, many uh, pathogens. They are, if you use this phenotypic approach, beautiful targets that you can find in S4B for flavies, the 2C for enteros, the scapping for um, uh, alpha viruses, and perhaps you need pan genus, pan family, and perhaps even multifamily uh, classes of compounds, and we could also consider perhaps the use of label use of some other compounds. So many people to thank, I don't <laughs> have the time to stop with this slide, but many people that I really deeply appreciate all uh, what they did. And I would like to invite you, together with Kaya Carter, Carter sorry, uh, you all to the uh, one and only uh, and meeting on antivirals, the International Society of Antiviral Research organizes the International Conference on Antiviral Research in, in Baltimore. And uh, of course, um, we have uh, excellent speakers like uh, Bob and uh, Diana uh, at the meeting. So it will be an excellent meeting, and I warmly, warmly all uh, welcome you all to, uh, to Baltimore in May of 2019. Thank you.